tutors, mentors, and the city with your host.com. The City Tutors presents Tutors, Mentors, and the City. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Kevin.com Brown, and I am your host for today's festivities. And welcome to Tutors, Mentors, and the City, brought to you by the City Tutors Organization. Now, uh, just for the record, I like to say this since we're kicking off this podcast early, and I don't know which episode we're going to actually uh, start with as our premiere episode. So just for full disclosure, I did not want that title, okay? (laughs) I am a big Game of Thrones fan, and I believe that when you're making a title, you should add the word dragons to it, right? When you add the word dragons, it makes everything more livable. So I wanted the title to be Tutors, Mentors, and Dragons. That's what I wanted, right? (laughs) Nobody seemed to like that idea, and they said, you know, dragons, that's a little much, but... How about we do tutors, mentors in the city? So I said, okay, let's do tutors, mentors in the city. So now, all that being said, as you know, City Tutors is a volunteer organization. We have have partners, we have sponsors, and we have a couple of thousand of the greatest volunteers that this city has produced. And um, that being said, I'm going to introduce our guests for this episode and his name, he, he in, I got his name off his email, and it's three very suave Latino names. I'm not going to try to butcher them, okay? So I'm just going to introduce him as Jorge, and then I'm going to let him fill in the rest. So please welcome my guest for this episode. Give it up for Jorge, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> welcome, Jorge. Now, what should I call you? What, what should the world call you? Yes, the world should just call me Jorge. That's what I go by. Um, No matter what what possible titles might be behind the name. Um, To answer the other question, to give people uh, context as to what you were talking about, my other or my last names, Alguera is my, I guess, my father's last name, and Vindas would be my mother's uh, given last name. But mostly, I go by Jorge Alguera. Okay, so so I remember, I remember, I grew up in the South Bronx, right? So I grew up in a, you know, it was black and Puerto Rican neighborhood. So all of my best friends were Spanish. Mm -hmm. So and I and I took I took advanced Spanish in junior high school. So that rings a bell when you talk about uh, using your father's name and your mother's name. But put give me give me a little more context. Connect the dots for me. Yeah, sure. So I am a first generation immigrant from Costa Rica. And uh, I was born there, moved here when I was 11 years old. My father had moved about six months prior. And, uh, you know, he he came here to, like most immigrant stories go, right? Uh, A parent would move to the country to try to give his family a better uh, resources, better opportunities, better income, et cetera, et cetera. And then my mother and my sister and I followed suit. Six months later, we arrived in. Um, at, we arrived at JFK, and I remember. I still remember like it was yesterday. Uh, getting into my uncle's car, who was the person that received my entire family, and getting onto the JFK uh, expressway, and just seeing huge roads, and I was like, "What is this? Like it? It's really like the movies." And uh, yeah, and then we kind of made a home for ourselves in Hempstead, Long Island. And I lived there. Oh, man, I lived there for close to, I want to say, 15, 16 years. Then family and I moved still in Long Island um, to East Meadow. And then ultimately, my higher education path brought me into the boroughs when I started my uh, undergraduate studies at queen's college part of cuny and i just kind of never wanted to go back and i've been around the queen's uh area for for the for the rest of of that time and try to stay within within the city and ultimately getting a job within cuny 
Okay, okay, that's a great story. So did you have the one of those typical immigrant stories where you come in, you don't speak the language, they're being teased by the kids? Is oh, that yeah, yeah, yeah. In in that sense is very typical. Um moved here. I remember when we were going through the airport and the customs agent asked me what school I went to, but I had no idea what he'd said. And my mom, I looked at my mom, I was like, what's he saying? And she goes, oh, he wants to know what school you go to. And I was like, how did you understand it? Right. Uh, but yeah. Now, I, well, you're, well, you and your mom, sorry to cut you off. You and your mom were communicating in Spanish? Yes. Yes. We, we spoke in Spanish. And she, but she could she was able to pick it up. Yeah. I don't know how. Um, ironically, we were taking, my sister and I were taking some intro English classes in Costa Rica uh, by this uh american or u.s missionary who was going around panama and costa rica teaching kids english but i guess the way the the custom agent spoke was a little bit too fast for me to pick it up and she was able to pick it up but i i even had an accent trying to say the word yes at that point right like it was just uh very little english uh was spoken if at all and um, we came here on a tourist visa, as a matter of fact, and then that's kind of where my immigrant story deviates in some ways and then stays uh, on par with, with other stories. Uh, we lived here undocumented for a long time. I, myself, close to 18 years, and currently I'm a DACA recipient. If anyone's familiar with it on the news, it's been top of news recently as as the attack on the DACA program began with the Trump presidency and now continues with with the legal battles in, in different um, courts uh, across the, the federal circuits. And yeah. So and DACA stands for? So DACA stands for Deferred Actions for Childhood Arrivals. So it's essentially a lot of times it's used inter inter interchangeably, sorry. Uh, between the term or the moniker dreamers, which are um, immigrants who arrived here before the age of many times before the age of 10, even, um, but definitely under 18 and through no fault or no choice. Right. We were kids and we were brought here. We didn't say, you know, what would be good migration to the United States? Let's go do it. And, and so through the Obama presidency, the executive action that uh, allowed not only allowed uh, more discretion in in who would be potentially prosecuted for deportation proceedings, but also allowed a lot of us to or anyone who applied for the, for such status to have a work permit in the United States that opened up doors for a lot of us um, and people in similar situations as I am. Right, we were. Uh, all either in, in high school or in college trying to get our education, but because we didn't have a legal immigration status, then the question was like, well, what could I possibly do with my degree anyway if if I'm not going to be able to work in, in anything that my degree might open up doors for? And so, yeah, that's currently where we are. Wow, that is powerful, man. Thank you. That's powerful to... to you know, when when uh, when you were invited and accepted the invitation to do the podcast, I didn't I had no idea of that, yeah. of that nuance. Right. Right. And that's the amazing thing. That's the amazing thing about that's the amazing thing about uh, life. Mm -hmm. You have no idea the the story, the backstory behind people that you're meeting in the street, that you're seeing in the in the supermarket. You have no idea of the, the, the challenges or the obstacles that they have to maneuver through just to, just to do day-to-day -day life in this, you know, in this, you know, supposedly greatest country, you know, on the planet. But right. that's, that's powerful story, man. Oh my goodness. So, so did you, while you were, you said undocumented, are you, right. are you living in fear? Like I see in the movies, like, Oh no, don't, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's one hundred percent the case. Um, a lot of times, very triggering to hear cases or 
you just kind of travel back to to that sense of you can't let people know it's this dirty secret and i and i say the word dirty because it is it's almost a, a sort of shame that you carried with yourself especially when you're growing up here and you in many ways assimilate to the culture but more specifically you're assimilate to your friends lifestyles right and so as a teenager when you start seeing your friends applying for the work permit so that you may be able to work during the summers and you go and try to apply for the same thing and a lot of us is the first time we learned that that's when we go to our parents is like hey i need my social security card so that i can get this job and then they they kind of mumble it's like yeah you don't have that right and, and you're like wait what um and, and that's kind of when that pandora's box is open then you start realizing okay i am exposed right? right even if people don't know i'm exposed to so many different things and you start kind of inheriting in a way the mm -hmm. fears that as that adults already know what the true uh risk of it all is you start inheriting mm -hmm. those well if someone finds out you could be reported to the authorities you could be deported out of this country you could be um stripped from what your dreams um right are and and so the fear is real um in in many many different and situations that may be innocuous to a lot of people right. so maybe you're riding the bus and at that point uscis ice or what used to be called ins would uh have raids and they'll pull over the bus and they'll start asking people for the papers and all you're trying to do is get to class get to work get home um so so the fear was there all the time wow. so so just just for um the thought the thought course crossed my mind so you the the documents you had mentioned you were granted the the daca daca so we can talk about this right talking about this now won't get you in any trouble Yeah, no, I mean, uh, what, what DACA does, it defers potential removal procedures, but it grants you a legal work authorization card. Okay. And then, then you're able to work on the books, as, as many people will say, right? Like you're, you're granted entry into the regular job market and out of the black market of work. Right, right. And then for many of us, um, it means taking up the profession that we wanted to, right? For many of us, it means something as simple, to put it that way, as being able to have your state ID or even a driver's license, right? Uh, and then there are the more audacious of us, who, um, to put it that way who want to go and push the envelope further. And then you have the cases like uh, Cesar Vargas, who became the first DACA recipient who was also accepted into the bar. So he was a fully licensed attorney through um, a lot of the help of uh, CUNY, the CUNY Black Men Initiative, the CUNY Law School. Uh, and so he became not only the first one, he not only became a pioneer and being able to open the, open up that door, but whether he liked it or not, he became somewhat of a, of a hero for people to say, Hey, I can do that. Right. Like now this door is open. And so I can, I can follow through even when um, maybe that wasn't even a thought, or maybe that wasn't even a goal when we were in the depths of the shadows of being undocumented. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, um, man, you're so fascinating to me. So, uh, but that's why I asked the question out of caution, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, I have, I grew up in the projects in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my friends, a lot of my, you know, the, my, my, the, the product of my environment, a lot of them were straight criminals, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're reformed. We were kids. They did some things. 
So now we're reformed, but you know, you got to make sure the statute of limitations have expired <laughs> before you can before you can talk about stuff. So right. I, I asked the question to make sure because I'm so fascinated. I want to know more. I want to ask you more yeah. questions, but I'm like, am, am, am I going to open a can of worms and then, oh, we shouldn't have spoke about that because of whatever. Yeah, but no, and, if you're good and, now. And thank you for that because so part of what my, and I don't know if, truth be told, I don't know if it's a mission that I've taken on myself or his or has been granted to me by either God, if, if that's how you'd like to see it, the universe is giving me this path. Um, when I started my higher education journey as an undocumented student, I had to pay uh, out-of-state tuition. So I was treated as an international student. And at that time in New York in particular, there were very few uh, higher education professionals who even understood what some of the rights or maybe some of the um, opportunities that undocumented students would have. And because I was involved in student organizations and because I was involved in trying to find mentors for myself that would at some point somehow open up doors so that I can become this professional that I've always wanted to be. Um, I then realized it's like, well, if, if I'm going through this, I know there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of, of people who are going through this and, but, but that's the thing. It becomes, it's almost like, like a grapevine situation where you only hear that someone is also undocumented because they know someone else who they trusted with that secret. And so then they become this kind of undocumented matchmaker, not for any sort of intimate relationship, but just for a almost an emotional relationship so that you can um, commiserate in that sense. Fast forward, I'm, I'm now working in higher education and I'm realizing to your point that um, living in certain communities or, or certain enclaves of communities, we know the numbers show it. It's not, it's not uh, an alternative fact. That's some, might people, uh, some people might put it that way. Certain communities are over-policed. And what ends up happening, if you hear the conversation about immigration, it mostly surrounds a particular phenotype. And we also understand that one of the main reasons why black undocumented youth and just immigrants are um, deported at higher rates are because those same communities are the ones that over policed and they get caught up because of other things. Right. And so part of what I'm trying to do is not only open up doors for the students who are trying to, or just let's, let's remove students for, undocumented immigrants who are trying to better themselves and at the same time educate those peers of mine, those professionals to let them know, yes, undocumented students are here, undocumented students, undocumented people are trying to better themselves, but they don't look like one particular group, right? The highest, if I, if I pose the question for you right now, who composes the highest number of undocumented immigrants right now in the U.S.? What would you say? I would think Mexico. Okay. It's Asians. Really? Yeah. All right. And it's, it, it, it's too, too, it's so pervasive, right? Because we can always say a group that it's someone who might not be immediately thought of American, right? But there are hundreds of, if not hundreds of thousands of, European undocumented immigrants, mm. right? And so there's there's that. Um, maybe you you you've read the book Passing, right? The Passing. Yeah. I'm like so, right? Like we pass. I mean, I'm I'm a white Latino. I tell people, like I'm a white Latino. I was like, no, but you're Latino. But my skin, my like what you see, and I remember I was told this in high school. And we're like, I thought you were white until you opened your mouth. <laughs> right. And so um, 
again, it, it's the education of not of not just making sure that our undocumented people who are trying to better themselves through higher education, right? That's that one, one sense of the education, but also those who are here who are, have taken up this mantle, have taken up this goal of being advocates in education to also train them into the things that they might be um, unaware of, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, and I get it, right? They, your day to day is to kind of facilitate certain administrative duties as an, as a higher education professional. And so you may not have the time to go and do all this extra research on w- what undocumented students may benefit from. So then the goal is, all right, these are some of the things that you should know when dealing with undocumented students. These are some of the things that you should understand about the undocumented population. These are some of the things that you should know as a professional. You shouldn't go too far in because you could also, you know, get yourself in trouble if you're trying, like we understand we want to help, but there are certain lines that you yourself can't cross. So we try to, um, in a way, provide understanding for the undocumented students, but also understanding so that you know how to um, protect yourself if, if, if that's the the best word I could come up with, but Mm -hmm. just trying to make sure that you yourself don't get in trouble and trying to offer help to other, to other students. You know, so, so fascinating, man. I have a ton of questions for you and it's, it's crazy because I'm a, I'm a African American from the Bronx. My family is from South Carolina. So descendants of slaves, right? My, I have a, I have a grandfather. I found out is Jamaican, but I didn't find this out till my father passed away in 2018. Right. So, so I, I recently returned to college. I went to college in the eighties. I returned, got my degree at city college uh, last year or actually five months ago. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm in grad school now at at city college, right. To finish the story. So Mm -hmm. I'm looking at your, your backdrop. Uh, You have CUNY BMI black male initiative, right. Mm -hmm. That caught my eye immediately. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I didn't I didn't find out about that initiative till I returned to college and the campus opened up. So that was basically January of this year. Right. Mm-hmm. So now I'm in academia. I'm, I'm going for my master's degree. So that makes me a scholar. I turned I turned from a, a college dropout from to uh, to a street dude to a scholar. Right. Mm-hmm. So when I hear your story, I want to ask you a million, like, I want to talk, I want to hang out with you, right? <laughs> I want to hang out with you and talk to you for a month because <laughs> you're, so, it's so fascinating to me. And here's the nuance. Here's why I bring it up. Mm-hmm. Because when you, when you go to college, you get on these, the, the email lists, right? And they invite us to all the events, the academic events. Mm-hmm. When I see the Latino events, Mm -hmm. when I see the DACA events, when I see the immigrant events, Mm -hmm. I don't read them. Mm -hmm. I don't go because I feel like they're not for me. Right. Mm -hmm. But so I would have never I would never attend one of those events to find out about your story. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that it's like you're you're a reason you're one of the reasons why we even started doing this podcast because the whole point of the climate of this country is to educate the people who are totally unfamiliar, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, as a, my my degree was in black studies, so my my that blew my mind learning about my people, right? I grew up in America in public school and they didn't teach me anything about my people. Right. So I get my degree in black studies. Now I know about my I know about my people and I want to know more. But I'm, as I learn about your people, as I learn about your struggle, you're you you got my <laughs> you you literally have the hairs rising on my neck, right? So yeah. here's the question. Here's the question. I'm a stand-up comic, so this might sound like a stupid or a funny question, but did you have any close calls? Did you have any moments that you thought this is it? I'm going. I'm, uh, I'm going, you know, I'm going to be deported. Did you have any, anything like that in your journey? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so after a while you kind of uh, create 
uh, or you or you develop a callus in certain things, right? So you you're a little bit more immune to certain fears, to put it that way, and you realize, well, if I am trying to better myself in certain in certain ways. I'm going to have to risk a little bit more. And that, to, for me, came in the form of owning a car, or having a car, and, and, and being a delivery driver. And I did that without a license. And I got pulled over, uh, I think it was three times in total. And um, every single time I got pulled over, I was like, this is it. This is it. Tell my mama I love her. Right? <laughs> um, it was just one of those. Who, and But... Every time, I, I really don't know what moved the, the police officer to just kind of say, all right, well, we're going to have to impound your car and here's a ticket that you have to pay four or $500 for being unlicensed and gone, get out of here, right? Uh, but every single time, and, you know, the political climate, as you, as you said, changes every, uh, every so often. And so even when a, a what's considered a friendly administration um you still have fear i mean even obama right obama granted this program and yet he is on record for being the administrator who deported the most immigrants right the deporter in chief is what a lot of people call him and the biden administration is following suit right um, so, so the fear has always been there. The close calls come different. Uh, I, and I think what prompted me to pull the plug on public transportation was when I started hearing about all these raids at bus depots and at just the bus is on its way and they'll pull it over and, you know, show me your papers or, and they get you. So that was kind of like my way of saying, all right, well, I need to, find a way to not be in those mass um, catch-all situations um, and, and and continues to be the case for 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 a lot of um, a lot of undocumented immigrants and actually to your point right um, as you were saying about the events and uh, that, that academia and colleges continue to have across one of the things that I wanted to make sure um, would I would bring to the Kini Black Male Initiative. Well, so every year there's a conference. The past two years they had been online. So um, you know we'll do some some shameless plugging at the end as to where to find those. But in those particular ones, I always wanted to make sure the immigration conversation was had in some of the panels. But not just the immigration and the undocumented students and how to support them, but also for those who were willing to put themselves out there. Right? And, and one of the things that we were able to do through Zoom is if you don't want to show your face, don't show your face, but let, let us hear your story. Um, it was also connecting that that undocumented students are not just a particular type of undocumented students. And so we. We made the connections in, in, have, in making sure that we brought forth the Afro-Latino um, story of undocumented students because so I'm a Latino, uh, Latin American Latino major. Uh, That's my undergrad. And so to your point on learning about your people and learning everything that, that goes on, I kind of became this avid reader and book collector of stories of immigration, but that look different. And so one of the books that I really love is called The Afro-Latino Reader. And in that, they talk about the amount of Afro-Latinos who were deep into the civil rights fight, right? And right, just like many people would say, I thought you were white until you opened your mouth. When, when it comes to Afro-Latinos, is the opposite, right? People will say, I thought you were Black until you told me you were Latino, until I heard your last name, until blah, blah, blah. And so, uh, again, it's, it's kind of the, the, the history of our peoples and our diaspora, right, on, on both ends, is intertwined in so many ways that it's important to have these kind of 
um, conversations or perhaps just to have the mention. Because then if you just do that mention in podcasts or in conversations, so it might trigger somebody to like, oh, wait, hold up. I didn't I didn't know that. I didn't, I've never heard of such thing. And then, you, you know, they might go and start doing their own research. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so as you're talking, as you're talking, um, what what we didn't identify because you did it real casually at the top of the show, but um, what's your what's your um, not your credentials? What's your position? What do you are you do you have a position with the Black Male Initiative or what's your administrative? Title? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I am currently the deputy director for the Kenny Black Male Initiative. At no, the yes. You're the guy I've been wanting to meet. I've been wanting to meet you. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so I know, I know at City College, uh, the first, the first uh, organization that caught my eye was, was the BMI. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it U-Man, but Norval Solon. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and I just met Norval this year mm -hmm. when I went to the school, but it turns out he, we went to the same high school. Oh, wow. We both went to Brooklyn Tech. We're both graduates of Brooklyn Tech, and we—he was the year before me. Ah. So, um, so but we connected. You know, here we are, forty years, uh, forty years later, or whatever, forty-two years later. But um, he said he told me that the BMI was a thing at City. I thought it was just at City. I didn't know it was CUNY. Why? Yeah, yeah. So, so now that I got you on, on the call again, <laughs> I've been trying to meet a guy. I've been trying to meet a guy at the top. So let me okay. ask you this question. Yeah. Uh, when I first go to college, I I heard about the BMI and I heard a, a horrible statistic. It said like six percent of black males that go to college, only six percent graduate. Right now, I never I don't know where I heard it. If mm -hmm. I heard it in the hallways, if I heard it on the street, I don't know how accurate it is. Mm -hmm. But when I heard it, I was like, oh, that's horrible. What can I do to help these underprivileged black males graduate? And I was in classes for six months before I realized, wait a minute, I dropped out of college in 88. I'm an under, I'm an underprivileged black male. I'm, an, <laughs> I'm part of the 94%. It blew my mind. Mm. So when, so, but, so I keep that as a mantra. Like when I walk through, when I walk through CUNY's, every time I see a black male, because mm -hmm. the women seem to be fine. They, the females seem like they got their thing together, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have any sons. All I have is daughters. And my daughters are, are amazing. My daughters are the bomb. Mm -hmm. But whenever I see these young black males on CUNY, I look at them. And the first thing that pops in my mind is, is he the 6% that's going to graduate or the 94% that's going to drop out? Right. Mm -hmm. Is that a, what is the statistic? Is that is that a statistic I just heard on the street and I exaggerated it? What is the, the stats? Well, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you the number exactly, but I know that. So the CUNY Black Men Initiative started 17 years ago because of that same thing, right? The number of Black men who were entering and completing the undergraduate degree was abysmal. And if I'm not mistaken, to this day, the group that has the best completion rate when it comes to undergraduate degrees are Black women. And so naturally you you say well they're fine we need to do something to bolster this other group the pandemic exacerbated those numbers and the, and the dropout rates for a number of reasons right whether someone didn't have the the physical tools to attend college virtually or because at home they, it just it was just impossible to concentrate and you're you know in so close proximity with everybody that I don't know my, my mom, if she sees me sitting down, that means I'm available. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I'm available for me to do something for her. Uh, and so I, I'm sure that kind of went across the board. And so the, the, the discontinuance rate, rate kind of rose from that. Um, now, because we're a public institution, we cannot say this program is only for black males. Right. right. It's open to any student who is matriculated at a CUNY campus where there is a BMI program and right. we have 30 of them. 
So and they look different on every campus. Uh, and and now what we're seeing in CUNY, like just the overall monstrosity and and the good way of of right kind of like this huge dragon that is CUNY, right? To put it in your terms, um, they're realizing it's not just that the students need access to school, but there are so many other factors that may prevent you, right? So some people may have stopped out because they were receiving financial aid and they couldn't pay the balance. So they drop out and they have a balance and they can't come back until they pay that off. So what CUNY is starting to do this year is kind of reaching out to a lot of those students and say, hey, we're going to forgive this. Just come back. Right. And and then you have programs like ourselves. You have programs like ASAP. You have programs like um, ACE now um, that are re-educating people as to what it, it truly takes to be a college student. Right. Because. I'm sure in, in your day and even in my day, you would call a two-year school and a four-year school, right? But no one truly explained that it's a two-year school if you're taking 15 credits per semester because your total uh, responsibility, to put it that way, to receive that degree is about 60 credits, right? right? And so if, you're, if you divvy it up, then I'm like, all right, so 15 per semester, blah, blah, it, it's, it's two years. And there was also this huge misnomer in I, I really don't know where the disconnect came from in, in this communication, but a lot of times people were like, all you need is 12 credits to be a full-time student and receive full-time financial aid, which is true. But what they don't tell you is financial aid has an end date, meaning you're getting covered for eight semesters. In extraordinary cases, it might be 10. But after that, that's it. You, you're responsible for the rest. And so in cases where Black and Latino males are also responsible for working so they can help at home, they say, well, if all I need to do is take 12 credits and they're covering that, I should be good. And then they come to their junior year or maybe even worse their their senior year is like all right well you owe us five thousand dollars and you're like wait a second where's my financial aid and so um it's not to say that exclusively it happens to black and latino men but we've seen that a lot of the burden in also um attributing or contributing to what happens at home falls on a lot of our black and latino men and that also kind of creates the vicious cycle as to why men tend to drop out um, and, and not not finish out their their degrees and and that's where we see that discrepancy between uh, college degree attainment in in those uh, ethnic groups and those demographic groups absolutely absolutely and another, another couple of things um uh like I was one of them right I can't judge them because I was I was them right mm-hmm. but uh, as as our executive director, Gary Rifkin, says, we're competing against New York City, right? CUNY's competing against New York City. And I remember in the 80s, there were, there were a lot of ways to make money in New York City. And there are more now in this gig economy. Mm-hmm. So if you, if, you want, if you have to help out the family, if you see your mom struggling, if you see grandma struggling, if auntie struggling or pop struggling, and you have to go out there and get a job, whether you're delivering food or driving Uber or working at Starbucks or whatever. That money, you know, changes the energy in your household. Mm-hmm. And CUNY has to compete against that. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's it's there's a lot of a lot of legal ways to make money in New York City. There's a le- there's a lot of illegal ways There always have been. But there's a lot of legal ways to make money. Mm-hmm. And another thing about us, our community, black machismo men mm. you talk crazy to us we out mm. right and mm. that's still i still have that chip on my shoulder i'm a sweet guy but i i went through some situations minor situations since i came back to school and i was like man if i was 
my 19 year old self, I'd never sit through this nonsense. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's real talk. That's real talk. And, and that reminds me of my, I forgot what year it was as far as my academics, but I was working, I was working in food service. I was working at this deli that was 24 hours a day. And so I would work the weekends. I worked Friday, Saturday, and Sunday overnight. And, you know, you're young and invincible and you're like, yeah, I can handle this. So I was working from 10 p.m. to 9 a.m. in Long Island. And I had a 1040 a.m. class at Queens College in Flushing. And I would leave work, go home, shower because I didn't want to show up. So I like bacon. And then like clockwork during the class on a Monday, I would just battle. I would struggle. And most <laughs> more often than not, I would lose the battle to sleep. <laughs> but Wednesdays, I was like, oh, I know the answer. You know, raising my hand, raising my hand. And then one day, the professor, I guess, kind of had enough. And she calls me over. And she's like, look, you know, on Wednesdays, you're always so into it. And, and because you participate, then the class goes better. You should participate the same way on Mondays. And I thought I was like, well, on Mondays is a little bit harder because I explained what my work schedule. And she said, well, then you should just get a new job. <laughs> and mind you, I was undocumented. Like the fact that I had this job was a blessing, right? It was one of these things is like, ah, I'm, I'm making it by the skin of my teeth kind of thing. And I, I remembered I w- it was one of those moments where I was like, I can... I can curse this lady out or I can just say it's more complicated than what you right. think. Right. And I can't do that. Right. And so I can understand how situations and, and, and I think in that particular, my particular situation was a little bit more innocuous, right? Because she had no idea and there was no right. way I can only imagine that it would be worse when there are microaggressions in terms of racial background, microaggressions in terms to gender uh, specific situations. And so I get it. I understand when you can be like, man, F this noise and flip the table and go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So yeah. And and it's, it's one of those things that I, I, there's really no, no, no answer to it. All right. Like um, it's possibly the best thing I, I, I can say it's like you just have to pause for a second and realize you're not you're not there for the professor. You're there for the goal. And you're like, while it might seem like at that moment, maybe I should call this person out and let them know how they're effing up. It might be just better, like for my goals, for my dreams of whatever i'm trying to do okay yeah you're right whatever and then keep moving mm-hmm. yeah well, those those are those are um you know problem solving skills uh that you don't you don't necessarily have when you're young when you're going when you're going around the track the first time right yeah, i've been around the, i've been around the block a couple of times so i have those skills now right yeah. but and that's one of the reasons i'm you know i, I i'm excited to host this podcast is one of the reasons i'm excited and i applaud you i admire uh your story and i admire your you know your accomplishment under those conditions right there are there are people there are people that fail and have all the privilege all the opportunities no obstacles a loving mother and a loving father and all their papers right when <laughs> to grow up in this country without documents sounds impossible to me right it sounds impossible i'm i'm documented <laughs> and i remember going through hurdles to to find my birth certificate to find my social security card so uh, i can just imagine how exponentially difficult it was for you because yours isn't my effort was just going go down to the social security office and stand online all day mm. But you didn't have that option at all. That sounds impossible. Mm. And and our country, one of the things I did learn as far as um 
Well, one of the many things I did learn by getting my degree in black studies, particularly. Right. Our country's on the wrong side of history a lot. We're on the wrong side of the argument a lot. Right. Big time. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And, yeah. and but we're and we're so arrogant. And 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 we and we write the history so we can we rewrote the book. <laughs> yeah. We changing we changing the story so often. But oh my goodness, I, I I'm applauding you again for your <laughs> for your survival. Now I know you mm-hmm. won't accept the applause because you you've seen you've seen the byproduct mm. of people that went through what you went through and weren't as fortunate as you. So mm. so we both know there's a lot of work to do. Oh, so nice. as a Mm-hmm. Yes, but as a side note, as a side note, uh, this we're gonna this part we're gonna edit out the podcast, right? Okay. But but uh, I'm a stand up comic. Uh-huh. I was a dropout for thirty years. Wow. I I had a very I had an excellent comedy career. Performed all over the country. Sold out shows. Performed in Radio City and headline. Awesome. I had an excellent acting career. Made a bag of money. Emmy Awards, Golden Globes, the whole nine. But I loved City College. I love my experience at City College. It's my alma mater. Mm-hmm. I want to. I, I recognize my responsibility to pay it forward, and I have some ideas mm-hmm. dealing with the the young black and Latino men that are in your initiative across mm-hmm. CUNY. Yeah. Okay. Across the entire CUNY, I, I'm signing up. I'm volunteering. I want to be a resource. I mm-hmm. uh, I think I have some things that I can bring to the table. That can, and that's why I'm here. Like I said, mm-hmm. I wanted to meet you. Okay, didn't know it was you, <laughs> but I wanted to meet you. Now exactly. we cutting all that stuff I said. We cutting all that out, right? <laughs> I just want to make the connection so we don't, so I don't miss the opportunity. Now, yeah. getting back to you, back to you. So, um, what else you do? What else? What else? What else have you? What else do you do in the CUNY in the public service? What other? What other things that I don't know about that we don't know about? So, um, well, currently, um, I'm in my third year. It feels like it's my 15th year as a, as a law student. Uh, I'm really? at the CUNY School of Law. and Wait, you're at what? The CUNY School of Law. I didn't know there was a CUNY School of Law. Yeah. yeah. Where's the building? What's that? Where's that out of? The building is in Long Island City, uh, Two Court Square. You can find it on Google Maps. And... Um, yeah, I mean, the, the CUNY School of Law, particularly for anyone who's thinking about a career as a public defendant, as a public advocate, as a person who's trying to right the wrongs, and I use that deliberately because it's a CUNY law motto, right? Right the wrongs that the justice system has thrusted upon our communities that's the school you go to not saying that as a cuny administrator not saying that as a cuny law student i'm saying that as a person that understands that getting through law school is not an endeavor that you do on your own and by yourself they create a community that's going to support you and embrace all those struggles that you've had to pull along with you up to that that um, moment um, to the point that we understand things like the LSAT, which is the law school uh, admissions exam, have inherently within them systems to keep a certain group of people out, right? And the CUNY School of Law has a pipeline to justice program that opens up the law school for for people like us. And I can say 100%, without a doubt, and and not in a cliche way, in the, I would put my check on it, right? My yearly check, not my monthly check, my yearly, like take my aggregate, my gross income, put it on there. I would not be in law school without them. Mm. And because of the number number one, the CUNY School of Law is the number one social interest or social justice school in the country, right? And a lot of what we do in our clinic work and our lawyering seminar work is 
to help people currently going through the system by advocating for them. So I did my lawyering seminar in immigration, and we actually help people by filling out their citizenship immigration questionnaire so that they can then become citizens if they qualify, right? We would go through through the whole ordeal. So that's that's one of the things, one of the additional things that I do. Um, I'm also in a pseudo mentor position, pseudo advisor position for the newly created uh, Men of Color Collective at the CUNY School of Law, where what they're trying to do is from a student to student perspective is getting to different CUNY campuses and just talking to a student is like, you thought about law when you were in third grade? Let me tell you why it's still possible. And so we're, we're kind of working on how to um, almost do a tour across all of CUNY to touch as many students who might be interested in being in or going to law school and um, just going across th through that. Uh, and yeah, just doing some mentoring on the side. And um, I think that's, I mean, everything else is pretty much booked because of, you know, my school workload and my uh, day job, I guess I, I go to school at night. And so, yeah, that's, that's the extent of it. I, I, my whole mantra is truly to open up doors for people um, whenever I can, even when they themselves don't um, don't know that those things are open for them. Right. Like you mentioned, you see a student and you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, if you only knew what you're capable of, or if you had these opportunities. Uh, so I, I kind of, do it though open it and do it in in a way that is like here's what it is but i'm also not going to force you right like ultimately you're gonna have to want it for yourself right and yeah other than that is you know i go to the gym and pick things up and put them down <laughs> <laughs> that's that's outstanding and that's that you you hit on you hit on what i'm referring to when i when i mentioned that i'm a stand-up comic right mm -hmm. because i believe as a businessman, I was an entrepreneur and I left school. I, I, I left school to start a business in mm -hmm. 1988. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I learned was the, the Trojan horse concept of business, right? Where, you know, in, the, uh, in, in Troy, they, they gave a gift. They gave this horse as a gift, but they hid their soldiers in there because they couldn't penetrate it on their own. So they welcomed the gift, opened the gates, welcomed the gift. And the thing that they didn't want to receive was inside. Right. Mm -hmm. So that being said, my, what I, what I'm trying to do when I come back to academia mm -hmm. from being, you know, on an Emmy award winning television show and hobnobbing with the biggest stars, a list stars in the, on the planet. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to introduce is the concept of the Trojan horse, meaning mm -hmm. in, in city, in the CUNYs, when we're doing a DACA event, we call it a DACA event. I don't think we should do that. When we're mm -hmm. doing a legal event, we call it a legal event. I don't think we should do that because mm -hmm. you're missing the people who aren't in it yet. It's mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're advertising to the choir, right? Mm -hmm. So my, my concept that no one, no one has embraced yet. It's sort of like dragons. Nobody... <laughs> Nobody accepted the concept yet, but my concept is if you present it as maybe a comedy show, everybody likes to laugh. Everybody will come to the comedy show and mm -hmm. in the comedy show, once you got them in there and they're laughing, now you slip in and introduce the legal, you know, the legal uh, track that's available in CUNY. Now you mm -hmm. slip in and introduce the immigration track that's that we're, we're fighting to oppose, right? Mm -hmm. So... It's a matter of uh, using, bundling our resources, right? Mm -hmm. And, but you already have the audience you already have. It's about getting the other audience. Mm -hmm. And my, my sister graduated from, from City College also. 
And she said to me, my younger sister, she said, Kevin, I liked that nobody spoke to me at the school. I liked, <laughs> I liked that I didn't have any friends on campus except for me and my, my three homegirls. It was just those four. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't socialize with anybody else. Yeah. They had their boyfriends they had their, and they had their crew. Yeah. But see, I don't, I don't like that. Yeah. My, my daughter went to Howard University. She graduated from Howard University. And I'm so, I love her. I'm so proud of her. But I'm in, I've always been in competition with my baby girl. <laughs> and I, I, I went to her graduation. And every time somebody mentioned Howard University, you start hearing chants, H-U, you know, a yeah. DJ would pop out the sky. Yeah. A marching band <laughs> suddenly comes from around the corner. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, they, they love this school. We yeah. didn't have that at City College. Mm -hmm. I want to get that. I told my daughter, we coming for y'all, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. We coming for y'all. So I need, to, I need to align myself with people like you, people in power mm -hmm. and who, who have vision. Or maybe you're too busy and you can unofficially ordain me. The, <laughs> the, 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 you know, the, the, you're the, deputy, <laughs> you're the de deputy director, the junior deputy. I'll be your junior deputy, right? And you ordain me with some authority to go around to these campuses, right? Because what, what it's about is access. Mm -hmm. And I want, I want access to these young people to let them know if I can make it, you can make it, right? Mm -hmm. And hearing your story, if you can make it, they can make it, right? We, we are the poster, we're the poster children for that, for that rhetoric, for that, for that story, that journey. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this podcast. Yeah. Because you have a story that we wouldn't know about. We mm -hmm. wouldn't hear. Yeah. And one thing I say over and over to, um, to Gary, who's the executive director of City Tutors, and Michael MC, who's the chief program success manager, I quote Teddy Roosevelt, of all people, mm. when he said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah. And when I meet all of you wonderful people who are on the front lines y'all care y'all obviously care but i was an undergrad five weeks five months ago mm -hmm. and every class that i'm in we do a we do a whatsapp with us just the students mm -hmm. the students don't believe y'all care mm. the students don't believe that the administrators care mm -hmm. the students hear the rules the students mm -hmm. hear uh the, the students hear the rhetoric that you mentioned, like, why do you why do you sleep through Sunday? I mean, why do you sleep through Monday's class and don't engage? Just get mm -hmm. another job. That's that's mm -hmm. what the students think. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. They think, uh, well, you're not working hard. You know. You should drop out. Maybe mm -hmm. this isn't for you. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the student and, and I'm in those rooms and it's unfiltered chat. Right. They don't yeah. know. They don't know. I'm, I'm one of you. They don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But the students don't believe you'll care. So they don't care how much, you know, because they don't think you care. Yeah. It, so and, <clears throat> to your point, you bring up something that that now I get to experience from both sides as well. Right. I get to see how as a student, I may not feel the support that I think a student needs. But as an administrator, I also understand the restrictions or the parameters that, as a professional, I need to follow. Now, there is, <clears throat> there have been multiple initiatives that are meant to close that gap, one of which is called New York City Men Teach, right? And it, that's... And perhaps that's the next person that you can have, you know, I'll connect you to the university director of, uh, of the program. Uh, the goal there is to have more men of color in elementary and high school classrooms so that a lot of times perception is reality, right? And so, so we think someone doesn't care because of the way we perceive them as how we see them. And vice versa, right? Like we may think someone cares because of the way we perceive them. So someone that looks like me might care a little bit more about me. That saying aside of not all uh, 
skinfolk or kinfolk kind of thing. But let's put that aside. Um, and so, so there's the New York City Men Teach in initiative of trying to get more men of color into classrooms. There's also the fact that there's an upswell on support programs and initiatives within the students who are trying to get into doctoral programs, into not just into, but through those doctoral programs, right? That allow us to be, once we have those, those, um, those degrees, then we can be in the situations or in the rooms where, where it happens. And then we can start creating new rules, as you said, for the administrators to follow, right? Keeping in mind that we also want to make sure that students are safe, right? That, but that's more of my legal brain thinking. And then, and then we also see individual endeavors such as what Dr. Chris Emden from Columbia University is doing. He is the pioneer, the innovator, the however monikers you want to put behind him. He started what's called the Hip Hop Ed Conference. And he infuses and he actually welcomes. He's like, why do we need to separate hip hop from STEM, from math? It's like music is math. Math is music, right? And he, he's grown up and then he starts, he's written two books. One of them is called For White Folk Who Teach in the Hood and the rest of y'all too. And then the other book is called Ratchetdemic. And it's, it's about that. It's about bridging the gap. There's this, yes, we understand that in certain situations, certain way of carrying are not the way that you should carry yourself in, in other places, right? But a lot of teachers treat the classroom as if it were a boardroom. And that's not right either, right? right? Because you're not that's not what the job is. Like you're there to teach, not to carry on this, like, Oh, well look at my ascot and whatever. Um, and so, so those, those kind of initiatives and, and they're starting to take on and, and kind of like move into places that you didn't think would move into. Right. Like, I mean, the conference, the hip hop ed conference is hosted at Columbia university, right? Like who would have thought about that? Um, where like, I remember the last one, it was right before the pandemic. He had battle rappers go in there and battle about nothing but science, right? And it's and and then you look at the room. We're in this auditorium, and there's a DJ spinning the best hip hop. And by the best hip hop, I mean nothing that's out right now. And <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying. Right, uh, right. But it, but then it became like it was like being at the yard at Howard University. It's just people dancing and as people rapping and as people, right? So there are those initiatives that at times I've also come to realize that maybe my job is not to create something new, but to just hold up those people that are doing it and just make sure that people are like, oh, this exists, right? Like many of my high school teachers, friends, I just post something about, oh my God, I didn't know this was there. Yeah, sure. Go ahead and, and do it. Or sometimes I do my little corny um, rendition of what they're doing, where when I was at Queens College, we would do resume and cover letter writing workshops. But I, I changed it. Like we had a resume bars workshop where you're sitting there. We're sitting with some instrumental hip hop and then we're writing bars like in our bars are what our resume uh, categories would be. But when you send, when you sit back and you see students writing their resume and bopping their head like they're at a club, you're like, all right, something's happening here. There's some magic happening. And, and it's about, yes, I think what you're saying is 100% true that, that the student might not feel that, this, that the professor cares. A lot of times that happens because the student does not speak to the professor or to the teacher. Right. right? And yeah. and that's the other aspect of, of what we're trying to do is um, we we tell we tell the, the students, at least when I was running the Queens College BMI uh, campus program. I would tell them, like, look, your professor put on their pants the same way you put on your pants today. Right. They woke up tired, too. So don't don't just because they have a Ph.D. in physics that are 
yes, that's an accolade to them. It doesn't mean it's a pedestal that you can't reach or that you can't break through just to meet them as people. Right. I understand also that having a conversation with a person to, to somebody might be one of the most frightening things, but all in all, if you, if you break down who that person is and it's just another person, it becomes less daunting, I guess. And it, it, it really is one of those um, situations where it is not just like, if you're only looking at it as, is my, pro- I'm going to talk to my professor because my grade depends on it. Then you're missing it. Right. Because you you being able to speak to your professor about an issue that you have as minute or as trivial as it may seem, that also gives you courage to speak to a professional that comes on campus. And then now here's your interview for an internship, right? Because you're breaking these barriers that you perhaps set on yourself, like, yeah. oh, they're here and I can't reach that as opposed to oh, no, this is another person and that other person, right? And ultimately, one of my messages to students all the time is like, if you're going to college and what you're doing is going to class and then going home, then you're missing it because the money, whether you're paying it or your uh, financial aid is paying it, what they're paying for is the access to the network that that school has. And if you're not touching on that it doesn't matter if you have a 4.98 gpa right you not being to network is not going to allow you to grow your net worth and then you've you've heard it many times right like philosopher jay-z says right (laughs) (laughs) yes absolutely absolutely uh you know the the concepts the things i learned in college i didn't realize what i was learning i didn't appreciate it right Mm -hmm. i me and my friends, I remember there were, there were 13 of us from Brooklyn Tech. And uh, and when we got our financial aid checks, we went shopping, right? We went and bought, we went and bought clothes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that being said, so the, li- the life lessons I learned, as I come back, I appreciate the value, right? Mm-hmm. I appreciate it now, but I did not appreciate it then. Like, yeah. like. I, I'm paying for my classes out of pocket. All I get is A's. I don't want anything less than an A. Yeah. Professor gave me an A minus one time or was about to. And I had to get on the email and negotiate. What do I have to do to get that to get that minus removed? Mm-hmm. But I didn't care about my GPA in the 80s. It was just whatever. Yeah. Um, so it's it's you you don't know what you don't know and you can't know and whatever and you know all that stuff. I, I do embrace my responsibility now that I do know. Mm-hmm. And I, now that I found some success, I have to pay it forward. I have to, I have to go back and try to reach out, reach back to these young people and, and help them, help them maneuver, uh, mm-hmm. maneuver through the challenges. Or, or uh, sometimes, sometimes is not helping the, the young people, right? Cause as you said, you don't know what you don't know. Right. right. And so, even if you open up a door for someone who's not, who doesn't know what that opportunity might mean, right? Then it's, it's as if you didn't open up the opportunity to anyone, right? Right. And so maybe it's not paying it forward to the student directly, but paying it forward in teaching an administrator how to reach that student because they themselves never had that or never understood Right. They don't know. They also don't know what they don't know. Mm-hmm. And it's OK. You know, you're on that WhatsApp and it sounds like you're able to connect with an adult professor, a, a, a mature professional this, in, in a similar way as you would be able to, with a student. So perhaps you can be the connector. And it was like, hey, professor, such and such. Look. I think us as a group of students might benefit from this. And then the professor was like, oh, well, I I had no clue, right? Like my my favorite professor right now is my business association professor because he keeps it a hundred, as they say, right? Like he keeps it to the point that he, he quotes Biggie and he quotes 
uh, Wu Tang in cases, right? Like, well, like yesterday, he even said he was like, you know, such and such was suing this company because he thought he had protection. He was like, and then he <laughs> completely breaks out of character and he goes, well, you didn't protect your neck, yo. You got to protect your neck with a contract. And so, so then people wake up and like, oh, it's not right. And I understand that's not accessible to all professors. Like, can you imagine, you know, a a 70 year old uh, professor of Jewish background who's never heard hip hop, right? Or never cared to, you can't ask him to do that kind of thing. But opening up as a human being and not just the rules, the rules, the rules all the time, then a student. What was that saying? Real, real, recognize real, right? Then the student is going to re- recognize that real within them. Um, I think, and I see it a lot in law school, a lot of our professors, even those who are of minority background, because they had to go through the, the rigor and the gauntlet that law schools have known to, to need to pass down to their students, then they almost feel like, well, this is how I learned. That's how you're going to learn and missing that in within this generation is not the same. Secondly, you're also teaching people who are full-time professionals who are not about the BS. I was like, yo, just let's, let's, but then the conversation is what we try to do. At least how I try to do is I try to then open up ways of training these administrators. And I mean, I even took notes as to, what you were saying, right, that the students don't connect because they hear they only hear rules. Or as you're saying, maybe the Trojan horse isn't necessarily the way to embrace the package. It was like, how do we get students to show up for something? Let's not call it a DACA event because we already know what that's going to attract. But what are what are we trying to to do? Oh, we're trying to train allies. We're trying to open up uh, ways of thinking for students. So it could be a training for administrators on allyship period. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right? And, and so, so yeah, so that paying it forward perhaps, perhaps doesn't fit into down to the student, but up to the administrator so that the administrator understands you're not communicating in the same way. Excellent. Excellent point. You know, uh, when I, I admire smart people. I admire you guys all of a sudden, right? All you people with master's degrees. <laughs> I didn't care. I didn't care for y'all, right? I thought y'all were a little tight, a little corny, a little whatever. But uh, since I came back to school and I got this new, new thing, mm-hmm. I love not being the smartest guy in the room all the mm-hmm. time and not being the smartest guy in the conversation all the time, right? Mm-hmm. So... Every every one of the administrators, I admire you guys, particularly CUNY guy, CUNY people, because I have this joke. I have, a, I have so much material, right? I have an mm-hmm. hour's worth of material about coming back to school. But in my in one of my jokes, I say, you know what I love about uh, the the administration at CUNY's? They're all gangsters. They all gangsters. They all got a they all got an edge to them, right? Like. You know, hold up, slow, slow your roll, right? Yeah. Even though they have master's degrees and doctor's degrees and all kinds of credentials. Mm-hmm. But um, yes, you you introduced me to a perspective just now that as you were saying it, it that's kind of what I'm doing, but I didn't even recognize it, right? Because mm-hmm. in my mind, I'm trying to help the young folks, but I do, I do recognize that. I'm I'm sharing something. I'm sharing a perspective with a lot of administrators because, like I said, I was at City College. I went there in 1980, Mm. 42 years ago. And it was a whole, the the CUNY environment was a whole nother animal. Mm. And now, not only is it 2022, but we're recovering from a pandemic. So I go to events at, at City College looking for the crowd and there's nobody there. Mm-hmm. And, and I remember the days where just to put our program together, just to put our schedule of classes together, we had to come and stand online 
for eight hours. The line was down the block and around the corner. And, and you would have to wait for eight hours trying to. And once you get to the thing, you find out the class is closed. Now you got to go back on <laughs> yeah. online and do that. whole. It was a whole nother beast. Mm-hmm. So I have a I have a perspective from every side of the fence. Right. But I didn't I didn't. I definitely didn't look at it from the perspective you just uh, brought up. And I appreciate that. I definitely appreciate that. That's why I want to hang with you for a month, man. That's why I, <laughs> you and me, we need to become buddies so I could just tag along and learn your journey because it's, it's very fascinating. You are an example of why we are doing the podcast. Mm. Most everybody that Gary reached out to has said, you want to interview me? Why me? Mm-hmm. And when I get in the conversation with everyone, they all have shared something that's tremendous, a tremendous. And just the fact that the hurdles they've accomplished, the challenges, the nuances, the, 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 the finesse that they use to maneuver. Mm-hmm. And by the time we get to the end of the conversation, I, I'm, I'm thinking you got to get off the call and you got to go and call your family and say, you know what? I'm a. I'm a bad, <laughs> I'm a bad mofa. <laughs> I didn't realize how bad a dude I was until, <laughs> until I, I think, got on that podcast. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and you hit something that's really interesting. And it actually didn't dawn on me until I took this, um, I took this writing intensive class at Queens College. I was before, before ever thinking of going to law school, even as an adult, I thought, I'm going to get a master's in fine arts and creative writing. Why? Because I have been doing creative writing before I even understood what creative writing was. Right. To give you an example, I came here when I was the way the school years are, were in Costa Rica, didn't match with what they were here. So our school year would start from March and run all the way until November. And then, but here, you know, it is, it's what it currently is. And so when I landed here, it was towards the end of fifth grade. And one of the things that we had to do was read the, the Greek, um, Greek. Yeah, I think it was uh, the Greek um, mythology, mythological story about Icarus, right? And the, the father and son who flew too close to the sun. And then we had to present it in class. At that age, no one told me, no one taught me, no one presented anything. And I took the story and I completely adapted it into a play. I wrote, this is the parts for this person. Here's my background people. And then I gave it to my group and we did it. My teacher liked it so much. We did a tour around the school presented in different classrooms, right? So I had been doing it before I even knew what creative writing was. And then as an adult, I take this creative writing class, writing about music. And what we ended up doing was writing what turned out to be like the first 30 pages to what could be our memoir. And when I, when I was like a memoir, like why would I ever write a memoir? Like what have I ever done to write a memoir? And I write it and my professor was like, do it, like finish it out, do your memoir. And then I realized that this, what you just said, the why me, we all carry the why me because we're comparing the me to whatever other people that perhaps we look up to have done and it doesn't measure up, right? But we forget that the people that are coming behind us, we're, we have already done more than they perhaps have done and they look up to us. And that's why I, right? Like, that's why me, why, mm-hmm. you know, why Kevin should have his name or why Kevin should um, continue to, I, and I think w- what you do, because, even now, like you make a person comfortable in, in saying, I can, I can talk about myself because that's one of the things that most people uh, feel truly self-conscious about. It's not, you know, like the number one fear is public speaking, but it's also public speaking when you feel exposed about yourself. So imagine public speaking when you're talking about your history and you're like, uh, but then you make someone comfortable and that's why the conversation flows. And, and, I think that's one of those. Uh, I, I love that you guys are, are reaching out to to the why me people, right? <laughs> if we're gonna start <laughs> the why me we, people, we just started a movement. We started the movement. <laughs> started the why me movement. Um, 
because everybody coming behind us needs to hear about us. 